Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back and let's get started with our interactive sessions. Uh, again, as interactive as they can be because we'll be back in the Zoom webinar. Um, please note we're reserving chat for technical issues, but questions may be submitted through the Q&A feature as they occur to you. And again, if it's a clarification or directions, I'll pitch them to Andrew immediately, or I'll wait till the end and pitch them at the end and fill with the whatever time is remaining. Again, our first interactive session will be led by Andrew Duffy of Boston University. Again, Andrew has been in the simulation business for a long time. I remember meeting him at a uh, workshop by Wolfgang Christian, the Fizzlet guy, about uh, more than 15 years ago. He is going to share with us some of his vast collection of HTML5 simulations, which I found very useful in my introductory physics course. Please send a warm telepathic welcome to Andrew Duffy. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be with you in Nebraska today, even if it's from central Massachusetts. So uh, you, hopefully you can see the uh, agenda. Uh, we'll see if we stick to that. But um, uh, I know it's an astronomy workshop, so I'll try and relate some things to astronomy. I, I, my background is uh, really physics. I've been teaching at BU for, I can't believe it, but it's 25 years. Um, so I've been I've taught intro physics that whole time. Um, and you think, boy, aren't you bored by now? Um, but you know, you kind of reinvent yourself all the time. Um, so about seven or eight years ago, we, we got a brand new studio classroom. It was a lot of fun to start teaching in there. And of course this year now I've been exposed to the, the joys of uh, remote teaching and online teaching like many of you probably as well. So, um, and it's been fun to, uh, to have these simulations to, uh, to use in, in the classroom. Okay, so uh, before we go on, I should acknowledge uh, the NSF, the National Science, Science, Science Foundation. So uh, some of these simulations have been uh, funded through a, a grant. And in fact, our program officer at the time was Kevin Lee. So uh, that's another connection I have with Kevin. So my colleagues on, on this project are uh, Emily Allen, who was with us at uh, Boston University, but is now a high school physics teacher at Governor's Academy in Massachusetts. And my uh, colleague, Manher Jarawala, who is uh, in the same department uh, as I am at, uh, at BU in the physics department. My email is down here at the bottom, aduffy at bu.edu. Feel free to send me email about anything, if you miss any links or whatever. So uh, here are some various links. Uh, I've tried to shorten uh, at least this first one. So Helen Reynolds, who is a physics teacher in Arizona, I, I believe she's actually British originally, but she's in Arizona right now. She's collected and kind of organized in this massive Google spreadsheet, um, 700 plus simulations and also some videos that relate to uh, physics. And so if you go to this site, HTTPS bit.ly, 2HSJB6S. I think you really got to pay attention to what's lowercase and uppercase there. Uh, you'll have access to, to Helen's simulations. Um, there are FET simulations as part of that. My simulations, some of my simulations are in there. Simulations from all over the, the world are in there. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, I started doing Fizzlets um, a long time ago, like 20 years ago. And uh, then kind of Fizzlets died uh, just you know, four or five years ago. And so it was kind of weird because I had come to rely on all these simulations that I had and then I couldn't use them anymore. So um, I tried to port them over to HTML5, which are cross-platform and uh, in really inherently open source. And so this HTML5 collection link is really the one you want to uh, use today as we're going through um, the presentation, I would put that one, the physics.bu.edu slash tilde, that's a tilde there, Duffy, slash sims.html. Uh, definitely put that in your web browser and, and follow along or just, you know, browse through the collection and see what's there. Um, that HTML5 thing is part of my bigger simulation collection. This actually has fizzlets that are working now because Wolfgang and um, has figured out a way to get Fizzlets uh, back on, on the road. So uh, they work again. So they disappeared and now they're back. Uh, we've done some virtual labs, um, astronomy, definitely uh, Foothill College has some nice things. 
So if you're into astronomy and want some simulations, there's some nice ones. And of course, Kevin himself has a very, very nice site here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, I assume you are familiar with that, seeing as I think some of the conference links have been through this site as well. But uh, poke around that site and definitely explore what, what Kevin has for astronomy. Very nice. And sort of the, the granddaddy of all uh, simulation sites is FET. Uh, I assume everybody is familiar with FET, but if you're not, here is the link to, uh, to FET down there at the bottom. Uh, just, it's hard to beat, beat FET, you know? Um, they do just some amazing, amazing stuff. Okay, so uh, here's, I'll talk about uh, anything vaguely astronomy related that's in my collection and I, We'll focus on gravitation, and I guess, uh, I assume as, as astro people are interested in optics as well. So we'll look at some optics stuff as well. Okay, so I'm gonna get out of my slides for a minute and uh, turn over to my browser. So I'll stop sharing that. I think you can see my whole screen here. So uh, you probably just see my lovely faces on uh, Zoom. Okay, so here's my collection here. So let's go to the top. Um, I'll just throw something up so you can see something in the panel. Vector edition sim, but there's 214, I guess, of my simulations in this list, plus four other ones from other people. Uh, the four other ones kind of somehow connect to, back to me, like somebody took one of my optic simulations and made the uh, lens kind of chain shape, which was really cool. And so I put that in the, on the list as well. Okay, so you go down here, it's kind of ordered the same way you might go through an intro physics class. And so motion in 1D, motion in 2D, forces, circular motion, energy, momentum. Okay, down to gravitation. So let's and have Andrew, a look at can some. Can you make sure you're sharing your screen uh, with that green button at the bottom there? Oh, I'm not sharing? I thought I was sharing everything, but I guess not. Sorry, Kevin and everyone else, if I was not doing that. Let me try again. I'll just, I'll, but I'll just share the browser this time and I'll maybe that'll work better. That should be better, shouldn't it? Okay, let me start that again. So uh, the way it works is if you go to the site, you get a big menu at the left-hand side and you just scroll down and there's various topics there. I've tried to group them based on uh, sort of the order you go through them in a typical intro physics class, as I said before. So down here, we're into gravitation. So let me bring in some gravitational simulations for the astronomy folks a little bit. So uh, here's one just with four objects that have mass. Um, you can show the net force arrows. There's the net force arrows on each one. You can hide those if you want. You can show the individual force arrows on the individual masses. You can turn those on or off as you please. You can change the masses. Okay, so this one is, you know, just looking at gravitational force and adding forces, vectors, things like that. Um, then I said, boy, it'd be a lot of fun if we just sort of let this go and see what happened. So. I found I could just spend like an hour just watching this one because um, you let it go and, and I've given them all kind of randomish initial velocities, sort of counterclockwise basically. Um, but fun things happen and sometimes crazy things happen. When they get too close, the simulation actually slows down by a factor of 10 uh, just to try and get the physics a little right. But you see some, some fun interactions here. And so that one's, I like that one. Um, what do we get else here? So binary star system. So there's just two of them interacting. Uh, then I've got these three in a row, Earth and the Sun, Earth and Sun, multiple Earths and orbits and energy, which are kind of related. And so what you can do here is if you just play it, you'll see just the Earth and pretty much the orbit we're in right now. So it's pretty circular. Uh, it should take pretty close to the right number of days to go around once. But then you can pick from uh, just a few other different uh, initial speeds. Okay, so you can let it go from the same point, but just turn the, the speed down by 20%. So this is, you know, one is what we're looking at now. So this is the circular motion speed is, 
is the one number. If you turn the speed down by just 20%, it's a very different planet that you're on. So um, the green arrow is the velocity, the A is the, the, the red one is the uh, acceleration. And so this one gets pretty, pretty toasty. We're pretty close to the sun there. And uh, what are we at? 120 days or so when we get really close. Okay, so just, you know, relatively small change in, in speed, 20% less uh, gets us a very, very different world. 20% uh, more. And again, it's a different world. This one gets pretty darn cold because it gets quite far away. And of course, takes a lot longer to go around. Okay, so that's the idea there. Uh, this one is, boy, that's a very precise number, isn't it? 1.4142. So you might recognize that as, as root two. And if you do root two times the circular motion speed, then in fact, you never come back. So uh, that's the minimum speed at which the orbit is no longer uh, bound. It's not a bound system anymore. So this one takes off and never comes back. And if, obviously if you turn the speed up, it's even worse. So that's kind of cool. We only have to go root two times the speed we have now and we're, never, we're escaping from the sun. Okay, so this is, uh, if you do the multiple earth version, you, can, you get the same sort of combination of, oh, I, let me go back to that one, show you one more thing. What if we like let the earth go from rest from this point, right? What's gonna happen there? So then we just get sucked into the sun and this takes uh, about two months. So if something happened and all of a sudden the 30,000 kilometer per second, uh, sorry, 30,000 meters per second orbital speed that we have went away, uh, we'd have about two months before we get scorched by the sun. That one's fun. All right, so uh, here's the multiple Earth one. So now you've got, instead of one, you have like five of these things. So you get the 0.8, the one, the 1.2, 1.4, and 1.5 versions. You can see everything that happens on one, uh, on one time. Uh, I like kind of doing multiple representations a lot. And so here's the same set. I love these numbers, apparently. Um, I'll talk about what you can do to change these if you want. And let's pick out a more interesting one than this, the circular one. And so if we hit play on this, this plot says energy is a function of time. And you got to figure out, you know, what these energies are. What are these anyways? Uh, so let's see now. Can you figure that out? So hopefully you recognize, well, this one, which is constant, that's our total mechanical energy. And then uh, got a lot faster there as it got really close to the sun. So this green one's the kinetic energy, plus it's positive, right? So that kind of gives it away as kinetic energy as well. Uh, every once in a while, when the graph gets to the end, it rescales the, uh, the horizontal axis. Okay, but this one's nice. Can you see that the kinetic energy is kind of a mirror image of the potential energy. I will be careful having learned from Gay Stewart and say this is the gravitational potential energy of the Earth-Sun system that we're plotting here. Um, and so that goes up and down, this goes up and down and together they add up to this constant value, which is a negative number and it's always negative for an, a bound system. So we want it to be negative, we need it to be negative. All right, and you can change that. And so you might go, hey, I, I want to see like 0.9, or I want a slider here instead, or what the heck's he doing? This, this thing goes off the, off the scale, right? So maybe you don't like that, so that's fine. Uh, these things are inherently open source, right? So every one of my simulations, first of all, uh, has a Creative Commons license, which means you're allowed to use it pretty much any way you want. Um, I assume if you make a million dollars off them, maybe you can give me some, but uh, not many people are doing that. Nobody's doing that. I'm not doing that, but hey, that's fine. Otherwise, you're free to use them and modify them. So if you go oh, on my Mac, I just do control and uh, hit my keypad, and then I go uh, view the frame source. Let's see what the frame source looks like. Then you get the code. Um, so if you're, this is what? 500 lines of code or something, 482 total lines of code here. Okay, so if there's anything you don't like, you wanna turn that green thing 
purple instead, whatever, uh, you can get in here, you can change the code. You can actually copy and paste this into your own text editor, change some stuff, uh, load that into your browser, then it's yours. It's your version. You can go, you know, use it to your heart's content, modify it any way you like. So if you're inclined to do that, feel free. Uh, every one of them is just inherently open source in that way. Um, this is actually one of my favorites. So let me just hit play. We'll see. So this is just the, the four inner planets. Uh, and obviously I started them off, you know, all to the same side of the sun, which is not all that realistic. But again, if you don't like that, you can get in there and, and change that. And you go, how come it took so long for people to understand this? This is like so easy, isn't it? It's just like things going around in circles. How is this hard? And of course, this is kind of the perspective from the sun, right? So this is centered on the sun. So now we can switch over to center it on the earth and see what happens. And okay, so we center it on the earth now and the sun goes in a nice circular orbit around the earth from this perspective, uh, but that's the only thing that does that, right? So here's Mercury doing some crazy stuff to some retrograde motion going on there. And if you let this play for a while, it, you know, it's like a little spirograph tracing out lots of interesting patterns. And uh, then you could say, you know what? Now I can kind of understand why it took, you know, hundreds, thousands of years for people to figure this out. Because this gets pretty complicated. Looks like Venus is going to come over and hit us, but it doesn't quite. It gets pretty close. And it does this little swoop and goes back away. And so, yeah, the sun is nice and easy, goes in a nice circle, but everything else is pretty crazy. So here's Mars coming to a fairly close approach to us. Um, that's around now, I think, isn't it? We just went through that, I think. Close approach was just a few days ago, I think. Um, but then it goes and spends quite a lot of time quite far away from us. Okay, so you get this crazy stuff going on. And, then you can understand why it was so hard to figure out what was going on. Uh, what is this strip at the bottom? So this is kind of, if you look up, this is kind of a 360 degree strip. If you look up in the night sky, assuming everything's kind of in the same plane, uh, kind of the, the relative position you will see. First thing I would say about this is the sun is drawn to a different scale than the planets. So the sun is drawn 60 times smaller than it really should be. So uh, that's the first thing. But other than that, it's not bad. Okay, so Venus doesn't really get to be the same apparent size as the sun. That's just a factor of 60 off. But everything else looks good. Why is this Venus getting so big here? And you can see the retrograde motion going on because it's pretty darn close to us at that point. All right, so there's some, uh, I'm probably off my schedule already, but that's okay. So there's some things you can play with there. All right, so let me try and get back on schedule. Next thing I was gonna do was show you some stuff about Top Hat. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of Top Hat. Top Hat is just a platform which really was started for uh, in-class quizzes. And that's what started us using Top Hat was um, we wanted to do some in-class quizzing for our, hat, for our, our, our class, but then um, you can edit stuff. You can build your own like ebook. That's what we've got here, an ebook. Uh, so let me show you our, our ebook a little bit and get into a little bit of, um, of optics as well. Okay, and I know this is embedded in Top Hat, which you don't have access to probably, but uh, you do have access to the, uh, the um, I'll put this full screen, the simulation that's in here. If you scroll down that big long list of my simulations, you'll find, for instance, a converging mirror simulation. And so it's embedded in here in an iframe. And so uh, that's another thing you can do is you can take any simulation like this and just stick it in a, a platform. It doesn't have to be top hat, it could be lots of different things as an iframe. And then the students can come along and mess with us, right? So this is basically an interactive ebook 
that we've got on top of that with, uh, you know, standard textbook stuff. Here's some equations, magnification equation, et cetera, definition of focal points and all that. And then uh, they can come along and they can mess with things. They can go, well, what happens if we move the object around? Then the object is the, the red one. The image is the blue one here. This is a converging mirror, so uh, you can pretty much get them the same size if you put it at a, twice the focal length from the from the mirror. Uh, you can change heights and see what happens. You can have these three special rays. Red one hits the mirror. Um, I should emphasize that the mirror really is something that looks like that, right? So. What we do typically is uh, we go to kind of the, this plane and, and bounce the, the, uh, the rays off. So it lo this looks a little weird, right? It looks like there's a plane mirror here, but it's not. It's a kind of representation of this kind of shape. Anyway, so we have this ray coming in here, bouncing off the mirror, going through the focal point. We have this one that just really does act like it's bounced off a plane mirror. Uh, this one is kind of the opposite of the red one. The green one is the opposite of the red one goes through the focal point here and then comes out parallel. And where the rays intersect is where the, uh, the image is, at least the tip of the image because you've left the tip of the object. All right, uh, you can show multiple rays, which is nice and show that it's not just the three special rays that, that converge at the same place. It's every ray that goes off from the tip of the object, hits the mirror, goes through there. So that's, that's kind of nice. Okay, so, uh, so this is kind of fun. We have the students. Um, so what we do on Top Hat is we charge the students $20 extra than kind of standard Top Hat. Um, standard Top Hat, I think, is $26 for our students, although a lot of them have paid for it already because they, they're using it in lots of our, our courses at BU. Um, so we, pay, we get them to pay $20 extra, really tax us the ebook, but then we say, don't bother buying a textbook. So instead of paying 150 bucks on a textbook or whatever it costs, they just have to have to use this. So it's we've really tried to, to chop the cost of our course down a lot. Okay, so uh, let me get out of here. Just go back. Okay, so there's one way you, you could use these simulations. You can embed them in some platform in an iframe and, uh, and be fine. Oh, now I'm out of my course. Now I gotta find it again. It was 106 spring 2020. You can see I've done a lot on top hat and a lot of courses here. Okay, so what else did we do on top hat? Um, last spring, it was crazy for everybody, right? For all of us, uh, spring break came along. Uh, at the end of spring break, our administration said, hey, guess what? We're going all online for the rest of the semester. That happened all across the country. And we're going, what? And so how are we gonna do labs, right? So we had three labs to go. So we said, okay, let's do some lab stuff on, uh, on Top Hat. And so that's why there's only three of them because we only had three labs to go in the rest of the semester here, but we had a nice lenses lab and this kind of went with um, this. So we had a Google doc and this one's kind of crazy. So in our Google Doc, we started making Google Docs for every class. But we did what we have lovely uh, studio classroom, right? And our studio classroom was so interactive. And um, then all of a sudden we're online. We're going, how do we duplicate this interactivity um, in Zoom? And, but the, with the breakout rooms on Zoom, it's super nice. So we, we did a lot with that. And we had the students stay in their groups that they were used to in the classroom and do stuff like this. OK, so here's just a nice ray diagram of, you know, an object and the image formed by this diverging lens. All right, fine, great. Uh, this one's wrong, okay? So you gotta fix this. So you can go edit this. We give the, what we say to the students is, make a copy of this Google Doc so you own it now. And then you have edit privileges and you can go in and you can mess with this. So you can go, uh, this Blu-ray doesn't do this. That's not what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to leave the tip of the object. So I should somehow, I'm trying to move just the, the uh, tip of it. That's not very good. Anyway, you can see this is a little tricky, but you get the idea. Ah, there we go. So it leaves the tip of the object, goes straight through the middle of the lens. Well, that's an approximation. That's our thin lens approximation and does that. 
And so they go in and they fix these ray diagrams, right? And so I haven't fixed it completely, that's okay. And then you can save this and you can say, hey, look. But the cool thing is, is you can embed images into Google Docs. Um, I only figured this out in, I don't know, April or something. Uh, maybe you guys all know this, but um, if you didn't, you can do it. It's pretty neat. And I'll show you a little bit more about how to do this a little bit later. Okay, so we combine this whole thing where they're drawing a bunch of uh, ray diagrams and doing some calculations to go with them. We combine that with this activity on uh, top at our lenses lab, where they basically take some numbers that they get from doing messing with all that stuff in the Google Doc, and they put their answers in here. So this is this is how we graded it. We didn't have our teaching fellows grade it. They didn't have to. We had it automatically graded on top at. But then we also had this section at the bottom, which was kind of fun, where we embedded some simulations in here. And so here's a converging lens simulation. And all you can do is change the position of the object. So I've kind of taken my regular lens simulation and uh, handicapped it somewhat to, in the sense that you can only, that's probably a bad word to use in it. I apologize for that, but I've taken away some features. How about that? That's a better way to say it. I've taken away some features and uh, you can only change the horizontal position. And so the goal here is to figure out what the focal length is. So, and you can calculate stuff, right? You, you can use the, the standard lens equ uh, equation to figure out if you put this in as your object distance, that in as your image distance, you can figure out what the focal point is, but focal length is, but that's no fun. Let's figure it out from the simulation. That is fun, isn't it? More challenging. And so the idea here is that you can get these rays to be parallel, then there we go, image distance at infinity. These are all parallel then that thing has got to be at the focal point right now. So this lens must have a focal length of 63 centimeters. So that's fun. Okay, so, uh, and it's a lot more challenging than just, you know, plugging stuff into equations. You know, what do the students really know? Do they understand this kind of stuff? Uh, this one was kind of inspired by this physics teacher article by Melissa Dancy Wolfgang Christian, already mentioned as the phys physics guy and his cohort in crime at, uh, at Davidson College, Mario Bologna. And they did some things in that lovely paper uh, like this, you know, what is behind the curtain? And they were doing physical simulations. So I turned this into an HTML5 thing. And so by messing with this, you should be able to figure out that uh, this is a converging lens that's in behind there. And then what's the focal point again, you can do it by just taking one of these object distances and one of these image distances and throwing it in the equation, but let's be more challenging than that. So if you put this guy right here, almost there, perfect. Uh, then you get image distance infinity. You must have it right now at the focal point. The base is right on top of the focal point. So the focal length is 95 centimeters. Okay, so that's some things you can do uh, with these simulations. And again, this one's embedded into Top Hat, but you also have access to this exact same thing in my big long list of sims over here in the uh, optics section. Okay, so I think and that's probably enough of Top Hat. What do we got? 2.30. All right, so I'm supposed to be talking about online labs. Well, that was online labs, but that's good. So let me tell you some more about uh, labs. So last semester, you know, we kind of scrambled to, to make up our own things for the second half of the semester. With a um, summer to prepare, we're, we're teaching entirely remotely in our class this uh, semester. So with a summer to prepare, we said, let's use Pivot for our labs. So I don't know how many of you are using Pivot, but it's really, uh, really kind of, kind of fun. So Pivot has, um, it started by Peter Bohacek. Uh, Matt Bonk is also involved. Um, I think Peter is really the driving force. He's a high school physics teacher in Minnesota. And he started off with uh, direct measurement videos. So this is kind of the next step beyond direct measurement videos. So the nice thing about Pivot is you can actually like edit like crazy the labs. So here's one that we did recently. We did this two weeks ago. Well, a week and a half ago. So let me pre let me preview this. And I love listening to Gay. I listened to her talk this morning. I hope uh, 
everybody did. Um, and because I always learn new things. Uh, and so there's probably things that I'm very sloppy about in my teaching. And you can probably see some of that in here. So I'll point some of that out, um, but that's okay. So we started by embedding one of our simulations into this lab, into this pivot lab. So the pivot labs are based really on videos, high-speed videos. And I'll show you that in a second, if you're not familiar with pivot. Um, but we can also take an iframe, take a, a simulation from the web, this is one of mine, and embed it right in the lab. And so that's what we did. And so this one, we told the students, uh, set the velocity of this guy to be three, set the velocity of this guy to be minus three, make them two M and M, and then just mess with the elasticity parameter. And I like, you can choose lots of things, right? Momentum as a function of time, you can look at that as the collision happens. Okay, so I'll just hit play and we'll see what happens there. And momentum is conserved. If you add these things up, you find it's conserved. You can do kinetic energy as a function of time, velocity, position, but this is a really nice representation that I'm not sure how many people are really familiar with, momentum bar graphs. So let's, let me try and take you through this just in case you've never been exposed to momentum bar graphs. So the blue bars are momentum before the collision. So it's uh, big and to the right for this guy because he's got, uh, I guess, kind of six M worth of momentum beforehand. This guy's only got three M the other way because he's got a mass of M. So that's why the CART 2's momentum before the collision is negative and half as big as the CART 1 before the collision. Uh, the system, of course, is you just add these two blue bars and you get that blue bar there. So that's actually the same magnitude as CART 2, just positive. And then nothing is transferred to the system. There's no net external force. And so the final momentum, which is in green, must be the same as before for the system, but it can change for the individual carts. But what has to be true is whatever momentum is transferred to cart one, so that's what this orange bar represents, uh, comes from the force applied by cart two on cart one. Of course, cart one applies an equal and opposite force back on cart two, so cart two feels an equal and opposite impulse. So if you don't like me labeling this as momentum transferred to the object during the collision, you can label this as impulse if you would prefer. That is totally fine but one impulse is the negative of the other one. Okay. And then as you mess with the uh, elasticity parameter, it's really interesting to see what changes and what doesn't change. So all we're changing is kind of the, the what happens at the point of the collision itself. So how elastic this collision is. So let me run this one. So this is the, the one where kinetic energy is conserved. So it does that. This is the other extreme where the, it's completely inelastic, they stick together. And what you find is system before and after is unchanged. Cart two and cart one before the collision is unchanged. Uh, what changes is really how much momentum is transferred from one cart to the other before the collision. So that actually is just what the elasticity is all about. You're changing how much momentum is being transferred from one to the other. And that really is what Gay was talking about uh, this morning when she was talking about you know the ball hitting the wall and does it get compressed in such a way that it can spring back and give you that energy back again, or does it not? And that's really what you're changing here as well. Same kind of things uh, as what Gay was talking about. So I really like this kind of this kind of representation. Okay, so that's on pivot. So we had the students go through kind of three ideal cases. There's no friction here; it's just perfect. And so they analyze it. They we've We've written out for them a table of momentum and kinetic energy, uh, cart one, cart two, total, et cetera. Before the, beforehand, they got to figure out what the corresponding things are after the collision. They compare these tables. They do it for a different elasticity. Same thing, do it for a third elasticity. This one's uh, elasticity of 0.8. Uh, the, the other one was elastic. The second one was completely inelastic. And then we say, Considering all three of these, what do, you what do you conclude about total momentum? Hopefully it's total momentum is conserved. Uh, what can we conclude about the total kinetic energy? So again, I'm being sloppy based on, you know, what Gay was saying this morning, but at least I'm 
defining what I mean here, total kinetic energy of the system is conserved. And by that, I mean same before and after. Gay, of course, is absolutely right that there is a time, you know, right when the collision is happening where the kinetic energy is, you know, less uh, because there's some potential energy being stored in the deformation of the cards or something like that. Okay, but I guess I'm not as sloppy as I thought I was uh, after listening to Gay, because at least I've got this kind of definition of what I mean by conserved here. I don't know if Gay would approve, but that's okay. Okay, and then we went into the real pivot part of the lab. And if you've never seen Pivot, here's a quick look at Pivot. This has nothing to do with simulations, but Pivot's just wicked cool. Uh, you probably can't hear this, which is good because there's an air, air uh, supply running on this track here. Okay, and the students can analyze that and see if the momentum is conserved. They can pick from lots of different combinations. So there's four different collision types, two different types of masses. If they pick, for instance, this, uh, this part's grayed out, so they can only do the equal mass one if the right stationary, et cetera. So they load that. Um, Einstein is in a lot of pivot videos. So that's what Einstein's doing here. He's all over the place. Anytime you have a pivot video, you're often gonna find Einstein here. All right, so then we had the students do the um, kind of idealized situation with the simulation. And then they came down here and they analyzed real things. Um, and they saw whether momentum was conserved, whether kinetic energy was the same before and after. This was a completely inelastic collision, so definitely the energy was not conserved there. And then they did another version of it. And these have these fancy springs on the gliders. So this is very nice. They kind of switch identity, those cards, I like those. And then they had to analyze their results. And so I think it's kind of nice to, to uh, do this combination of, of uh, simulation kind of idealized and then real life stuff. You can argue, we can have an argument about whether the videos are real life, but they're a lot more real life than, than uh, the simulations are. That's for sure. Okay, uh, what else? Let me show you this one. This is the one we used just the other day in class. And so we just have a block going down a ramp here. <laughs> um, you might say, this is weird. What is he doing? Play button, pause button, step back, step forward, reset. What is this other play button doing here? I'll tell you about that in a second. Anyway, so what we had the students do was we really just gave them, do I have that here? That's here. We gave them uh, Google Doc, because anytime we have the students working together in groups, we're doing Google Docs. So this is our energy conservation. This is our second energy conservation packet. There's a nice kind of problem based on energy to worry about. And then there's this energy thing. And this is cool too, right? That you can take a, an animation from a simulation and embed it into a Google Doc as a GIF. And it's, it's there as an animation. So you can make animated Google Docs. So that's kind of fun. We like doing that. Uh, and then what we had, we had them draw graphs of energy as a function of, of basically distance traveled and energy as a function of time. And what they're supposed to figure out based on thinking about various equations is that when you plot kinetic energy as a function of distance, the force is constant here. So that should be a linear graph and potent, gravitational potential energy is also kind of linear with distance. So all these graphs you plot as a function of distance should be linear. Whereas if you go, well, let's see, um, well, you could argue D is 1 half AT squared. So you can replace all these Ds by 1 half AT squared and you'll see the kinetic energy goes to T squared. Or if you go, well, V is AT, if I square that, I get V squared is A squared T squared, V squared is going as T squared. So you expect these time graphs to be uh, quadratic. Okay, so we had them wrestle with that, try and draw them. They actually did quite a nice job on that, but this was not an easy task for sure. And then afterwards we said, hey, uh, if, you had, if you struggled with that, here's this nice simulation where you can actually see these graphs play out in real time. Um, it's kind of interesting to see this, this happen in real time. So that's what those graphs will look like. Lovely linear graphs for energy versus position and 
quadratic for energy versus time. You can turn on uh, friction. Okay, so a little coefficient of friction. And then what I've got is, uh, you know, friction is doing work. That's one way to put it. But you can also say, well, that energy is really going into thermal energy. So I'm plotting thermal energy. That's what's missing from the mechanical energy there. Still linear with distance, quadratic with time. Okay, so the students struggled with that uh, on their Google Doc, really had to think about what those graphs should look like. And then they get to play with the simulation afterwards and mess with the coefficient and see what that did and, and really see these graphs play out in real time. So I think that was a nice, uh, a nice exercise for them the other day. Um, this is why I have a two play buttons on here. So I've got this, how did I make that little animation? So there's a program called Giphy Capture. Uh, let me load it on my computer here and it's not gonna work though, is it? Let me, I'm gonna try this and see. I'm going to share my whole desktop in hopes that it'll work better. So let me try sharing that. Okay, I'm gonna get my Giphy capture. Giphy is spelled G-I-P-H-Y. Giphy capture, free program. And so Giphy capture comes up and you just stick it over top of what you want to uh, take an animation of. And what I wanted to do was take an animation of just the little block sliding down the ramp. Um, but what I found was that when I put this little window over top, I couldn't access the play button anymore. So I'm going, I want to get at this thing, which is right underneath this thing. So uh, I changed the simulation to add another play button. That's why I needed the second play button so I could actually do this with Giphy Capture. So uh, I'll hit record and it's recording. I'll hit play and it goes down here and it's capturing some video just the animation it goes all the way down. Okay, fine. You hit stop and then you've got it. Uh, I think this is the most recent one here. It's a long video where it's nothing is happening. And I don't know if you can see or not on your screens, but uh, let me move this thing. But you can have a little slider where you say, I want to start the video from here, ignore all the previous uh, frames where I was, you know, resting with the, the web browser trying to make it uh, go. And then you can stop it anywhere you want. Uh, stop it right around there is good. And then you can save it as various different formats. So you can save it as, you know, standard movie format. Um, video, uh, MP4, but I like saving mine as GIFs or GIFs, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, because then it's just like a regular picture, but it's an animation. And so you can embed it in, in a, uh, a Google Doc, for instance, and uh, you're good to go. And you saw that over here with our energy conservation thing. So that's exactly where this guy came from. I did a Giphy capture on that and stuck it in there. Okay, uh, let me cancel all this and try and get out of Giphy Capture. All right, so um, there's that. I'm gonna go back to my slides for a little bit. I'm gonna unshare this, get the slides ready. Just to show you, this is really not totally simulation related, but um, I think it's just good to know, cool things to know. So let me go back and share my slides. Here we go. So this is how you make editable diagrams in Google Docs. Uh, and again, maybe, you know, everybody on here knows this and I was the last to figure this out, but maybe there's someone who hasn't figured it out already. So uh, I just make a background image that I want, for instance, with my, um, Ray diagrams, I just took a, a shot from one of my simulations actually and used it as a background image with a, with a lens and just the focal points and things like that. And then you don't do insert drawing, um, you know, picture you do, or sorry, insert picture, you do insert drawing new, which is the third thing on the insert menu. I'll show you that in a second. We'll do one of these live. 
and then you upload your background image and then you can add arrows and text and stuff for the students to go in and edit and move around. And we have two semesters worth of Google Doc class worksheets available here uh, for intro physics. So again, this is a shortened link for you. The, the regular one is like 50 times longer than this. This is an O, the letter O, 3D O, X and BQ. And when I say there's two semesters worth of Google Docs, you'll see actually, uh, in fact, now there's five tabs in this thing. Oh, my, Google, my Giphy thing is still on. Let me try and get rid of my Giphy thing. And bring my slides back. Okay. Um, if you go to this spreadsheet, you'll see four tabs from the summer. We taught our 105 and 106 classes in the summer. Those are our algebra-based intro classes for uh, physics first semester, second semester, 105, 106. And then we've also got our 211 and 211, uh, 212 classes. That's our calculus-based intro physics uh, stuff. And you have access to Google Doc worksheets for basically the entire two semesters for both an algebra-based sequence and a calculus-based intro physics sequence. And there is a fifth tab now. Uh, I see our, our 106 class this fall is putting their uh, modified Google Docs up there too, which is very nice. Okay, so um, that's great. Let me just show you that in action so you get this feel for what is different about adding a picture versus adding a, a, a drawing. Okay, so I'll stop sharing this. Go back to 248, that's okay. I'll share my browser again, which is here. And I'll go over to this. Okay, this is a, a packet which is uh, on energy bar graphs, in fact. So we say, here's a set of energy bar graphs for this particular collision, these are correct. And you gotta figure some stuff out from that, like how fast is cart one going after the collision and cart two, et cetera. Uh, then we go, this is a little bit different. We change the, uh, the elasticity. The gray, arrow, uh, gray bars are correct. The yellow, green, and blue bars are wrong. They gotta come in and edit this picture and change the bars and make them right. Okay, so that's how, how that's supposed to work. So how do you get one of these things in here? So I'll go over here and, uh, oh, here's where I added another copy of that. Isn't that nice? Um, let me do another one. I'll just delete this one, start again. So I go, insert. If you insert an image, you just get this thing, which is just a picture. But that can be a, a, um, an animated GIF or GIF, whatever, however you say it. Um, so that's how you do that. But if you want an editable thing, you do this insert, drawing, new. And then with this icon over here, the last one, you can grab a background image and just pick an image from somewhere on your computer or wherever. And so here's what I did for my energy um, graphs. I had just this uh, set of axes ready to roll and taking a while, but here it goes. Oh, that's not the, uh, I thought that was the axis, but anyway, you get the idea. You put a picture in here. I don't usually put animation in there. That's a little bit different, that's okay. And then I start drawing some stuff, right? I add text or I add, um, arrows for the uh, students to mess with. And, and usually I, I add these myself and then the students can come along and you know draw a free body diagram with it or whatever. But we've really gotten a lot of mileage out of these editable diagrams in Google Docs. So just wanted to share that with you guys. Okay, so I have talked for a long time um, I'm going to see if Kevin has any questions showing up in the chat. Oh, this is lovely, isn't it? Can you still see that? The uh, image of the solar system there. Uh, but feel free to ask any questions at this point. And if there are no questions, I can keep just randomly picking the, up. Uh, the Q&A is empty right now. Let it's empty right now, did you say, Kevin? Yes, let me, while the questions are coming in, let me just add that uh, I use a program called iSpring to create my pre-class lectures, and I don't recommend that because it's expensive. <laughs> it, work, it works very well, but it's, it's, uh, it's more expensive than I like. 
But anyway, yeah. the point I want to make is I'm, I'm, it's, I'm with it. I'm very able to steal your stuff effectively. I just grab one of your simulations and pull it into iSpring and there's no uh, screwing with it in any way. And I can, I can narrate over the top and tell students, please try this, try that, and, or see if you can answer this question. So it enables me to, um, to, yeah, can, to kind of encourage students to, um, to be interactive. I don't know what percent of them actually do what they're supposed to do, but um, I will learn that at some point in the future. Well, that sounds great. Do we have any questions for Andrew? Okay, here's one that's come in uh, regarding the solar system model in HTML. Do you have data sets incorporated from the satellites and or NASA? I do not. No. Um, you know, I, I'm really kind of focused on intro physics, so I'm doing a lot of uh, kind of basic stuff. Um, so I don't have any, you know, big data stuff embedded in my simulations. Did you do any of that, Kevin? No, I mean, again, I'm much more focused on um, letting students play with the, the concepts as kind of really to bring in real world simulations or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, here's, here's another, another one. question. Uh, could you use Giphy Capture for Adobe Flash simulations to save them before they are gone for good? Uh, you could save it as an animation. I think you can put it on top of anything and uh, run it in the background and it'll, it'll cap, capture it as a movie or an animated GIF. Yeah, you bet. Okay, uh, here's one we're going to use this week, actually, this coming week, this uh, pendulum simulation. And well, let me crank the angle up a little bit. This is a little crazy, 60 degrees, that's okay. You see there's two things here oscillating back and forth. So the orange one is what uh, the small angle approximation says should happen. And the purple one is what real life says should happen. And you'll see they're a little bit different. If you crank the angle down, you go there. You can't really see the orange one for a while because the small angle approximation works very well at small angles. But let me ask you this. And this is something that I didn't really think about until I wrote this simulation and I played with this myself. Uh, and so I learned something right in the simulation, which was kind of uh, kind of fun, right? I didn't program this in to do it. I just did it. So here is energy for the small angle approximation. So what I want to ask you is, is the small angle approximation consistent with conservation of energy? And so the actual pendulum, of course, is consistent with conservation of energy. It's just gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy going back and forth, no problem at all. And so you can look at that here. Uh, you can plot energy as a function of time and uh, lovely straight line across the top. This is for, again, the real guy in purple. Okay, so it's kinetic and potential oscillating back and forth. You can plot energy as a function of angle instead, which is I like doing. Again, lovely constant line there. Uh, potential energy in, in blue, one half kx squared, and then kinetic in, in red. Small angle approximation. Let's have a look at that. Uh, let's crank the angle down a little bit. So let's say, you know, you're at 10 degrees. What happens in the small angle approximation? That looks pretty good. Looks like energy is conserved. Okay, great. What about bigger angles? Let's go to 60 degrees again. Okay. What is going on now? This green line is supposed to be the mechanical energy starts off here, goes up. It's higher in the middle than it is at the end. Energy is not being conserved here. If you go even higher, it gets even worse. Okay, so it goes crazy. It starts you know, something like, I don't know what that is, 23 or so, but it goes way higher than that. So small angle approximation, not consistent with energy conservation. And that's, of course, because the small angle approximation overestimates the restoring torque, especially at big angles. And so it thinks the uh, object, the bob or whatever, should be going faster at the bottom than it, than it really is, okay? And so you get a larger kinetic energy than you really should have. 
And this was something I never really thought about until I actually saw my own simulation demonstrate this. Um, so that was fun. I learned something myself about small angle approximation not being consistent with energy conservation. If I just sat back and thought about it, I probably should could have come up with that myself. But it wasn't until I actually saw this simulation that I wrote without meaning to let it demonstrate this exact thing um, that I get the message there. So sometimes you learn some things doing simulations. Any other questions on anything? There is a plug here for a Universe Sandbox, which is on Steam. And again, that's more of an, an astronomy thing, but it allows you to smash things together on a pretty substantial scale, like clusters of galaxies and other things like that. It, it, it's, a, it's about a destruction. <laughs> Universe sandbox. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Well, Andrew, I want to thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. And you've certainly given us a lot to, to look at today. And if we could all send some telepathic thank yous to Andrew, uh, we'll kind of uh, wrap up and get ready to move to our next meeting. Thanks, okay. everyone. Yep. Thank you.